Welcome aboard Just Jets with your captain, Matt O'Leary. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. Hello and welcome to episode number 69 of Just Jets. What's going on? I am Matt O'Leary. Excited to be hanging out with you, talking some New York Jets football. Today we'll be getting into Makai Becton and just the overreaction from a lot of Jets fans online and in the comment section. And of course, your voicemails. But before all of that, just wanted to remind you that Father's Day is coming and weather is catching heat. Whether you have a dad bod or you're rocking a six pack, make sure you and your dad are smelling nice and shaved where it matters most. Make your dad proud this year and get him and yourself the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 and Refined Cologne by Manscaped. The brand new Lawnmower 4.0 and Refined Cologne is perfect for you and the dad in your life to complete your grooming game. Get 20% off and free shipping with promo code JETS20 at manscaped.com. Buy yourself something nice and get something nice for dad as well. So let's jump into today's episode. Like I said, talking Makai Becton injury and talking about your voicemails and stuff like that. Voice is completely shot today. A couple of reasons why. I'll get into it. It kind of makes sense. It's going to loop back to the Jets, I promise. But So last night, I record on Sundays. Episode comes out on Mondays. Last night being Saturday, I was at the Islander playoff game. As so was Dan Feeney, Zach Wilson, and a, a large portion of the New York Jets as well. So part of the reason why my voice is gone is because of that. Number two, I have terrible seasonal allergies. So that, the yelling and screaming and celebrating and drinking, on top of the already bad seasonal allergy time for me, is a no bueno. So I'm going to power through. Appreciate you guys sticking with me. I know it's not great. Next week we'll be back, hopefully better than ever. Uh, but we're just going to have to make do for now. So uh, sorry about that. Apologies in advance. But let's talk about the overreaction. Makai Becton has plantar fasciitis and is going to be staying off his feet for a little while. He's not going to miss training camp. He's not going to miss the preseason. He's not expected to miss any games. But for some reason, Jets fans are crapping themselves right now, for lack of a better term, because Makai Becton's a little banged up and has plantar fasciitis, which is something to do with your foot, the bottom of your foot where you experience uh, a pain. So clearly the Jets are just being a little precautious right now. He's not going to need surgery or anything like that. But the amount of comments and concern that I've seen online about Makai Becton is truly remarkable. Yes, a couple of things can be true. Makai Becton could afford to lose some pounds. That is 100% true. But to say that this is going to be a problem for the course of his career, it's way too early to know. He's, what, 22 years old? And you're already going to put out there and say that a 22-year-old can't lose weight? Like, at 6'7", 364. That's it. He's going to be stuck playing at that to the end of his career, I guess. There's a 0% chance that Makai Becton can lose weight. I don't buy that. I don't buy it for a second. Is it a potential issue right now, his weight? Maybe. Maybe that has something to do with the plantar fasciitis, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you right this second because there's no way of me knowing... And there's no way of you knowing that this is going to be an issue for the course of his career. It's way too early in his career to say, ah, injuries are an issue, especially since he only missed two games last year. Played 14 games last year. I wouldn't necessarily classify that as injury prone. When you play in a majority of the season, you start a bunch of games at Louisville. I, I'm i not I'm not going to sit here and do it. I can't. I can't. It's, it's way too early to definitively say, ah, this guy is going to be an injury problem. And majority of the time, the same people are the ones who wanted to keep Sam Darnold and wouldn't talk about Sam Darnold missing three-plus games even his thir- first three years at the most important position in the sport. Don't talk about that. But your left tackle missing two games in his rookie year and then being a little bit banged up and, and has no fear of missing training camp, the preseason, regular season games, that's an issue. I don't see it. I actually saw in one of the comments on one of my videos that the Jets made a mistake drafting Makai Becton and that they should have drafted Tristan Wirfs. That's not fair. Wirfs had a really good year last year. I'm not going to sit here and say that Tristan Wirfs wasn't good. He was. But he played right tackle. It's not the same. And he played right tackle on the best team in the NFL, the team that won the Super Bowl. 
Mekhi Becton came in on a brutal offensive line, played left tackle, and had success. Did Werfs have the better rookie year? I guess probably. If you want to get technical, sure, he did. But at a less impactful position, right tackle versus left tackle. Does Werfs play the same way that he did on the less important side and on a better team? If he is coming into the New York Jets and being moved over to the left side, is he as good as what Mekhi Becton was last year? There's no way of knowing that. There's none. So we can't possibly, realistically, with any sort of found logic, say that it was a mistake to draft Mekhi Becton, especially after his rookie year. He was damn near a Pro Bowl caliber left tackle at 21 years old. And he's a freak. He's 6'7", 364. Pump the brakes, please, on that the Jets made a mistake and that he's going to be an injury problem for the course of his career. There's no way of knowing that. It's not like he only played four games last year. It's not like he only played four games in college. In the one season he got banged up in college, he still played nine games. He started 10, 12, nine games in college, 14 last year, and he's not going to miss any time right now. He's not playing at OTAs. They're voluntary anyway. What's the difference? Who cares? It doesn't matter. I don't understand why people are so bent out of shape over this. It's ridiculous. Absolutely insane. And last year, in a year he played really well as a rookie, no preseason, limited action in training camp. There were so many factors going into last year and last year being a bizarre year. But the 14 games of stellar play from a 21-year-old left tackle wasn't enough. I don't get it. The overreaction from Jets Twitter and the comments section especially is just bananas to me. So with that, let's try to save my voice a little bit and get to your calls and your voicemails. We'll start things off with Max in New Jersey. Hi, this is Max from home to New Jersey, and I have a really good question for you. Do you think the Jets should sign Julio Jones this year? So Julio Jones is still, he wants to be traded from the Atlanta Falcons, and I really feel like the New York Jets could I understand why a lot of people don't want Julio Jones, and I can agree with your opinion. Julio Jones is on 30 years old, and receivers usually decrease once they're 30 years old. They're, he's not going to have that much production. Look at A.J. Green. When he, the last few years on the Bengals, he was really crap. This is the thing, though, why I want Julio Jones. We don't have a wide receiver one on the Jets. We have Elijah Moore, Denzel Mims, Jamison Cratter, Keelan Cole, and Corey Davis. I understand, like, we might limit touches, That's but five they're deep. not wide receiver one. Julio Jones, though, is a wide receiver one. He's been on the Falcons. He's been a top five wide receiver with when he was playing with Matt Ryan, Calvin Ridley, and he was a top five wide receiver when Mike McFlore was the coach at, of the Atlanta Falcons. What's your thoughts, and do you think the Jets should sign Julio Jones go, and go Jets? I am. I I wanted to play this call. I know it's technically old news because you got traded to the Titans today, which I think is a good move for them. Uh, I don't think the uh, the Falcons got nearly enough for Julio Jones, but I guess when you have no leverage, leverage that's going to happen. Not everyone can be Joe Douglas wheeling and dealing. A wide having a wide receiver one, quote unquote, is one of the most overrated things and overly talked about narratives. When it comes to the NFL, give me a deep receiving core over having that one stud any day of the week. Corey Davis is a fine starting outside receiver. Denzel Mims is a fine starting outside receiver. In the slot, Jamison Crowder is a very good slot receiver. Elijah Moore should also be a very good slot receiver. If Keelan Cole is your number five receiver, no matter what the top four in front of them look like, that's really good. That's a good group of receivers. I don't care about not having a, a cream of the crop, top five, top ten guy. That doesn't matter to me. Would it be nice? Sure, but I don't think it's necessary when building a roster that you have to have a guy like that. You don't. Give me a deeper one where you can spread the ball around and you can get beat by five different guys and not just get beat by one guy. And, it, okay, you trade for Julio Jones. He's going to be on the roster for the next couple of years because he's a huge dead cap if you move on from him. That's going to take away how many targets from Denzel Mims and Elijah Moore, who you just spent, what, top 50 picks on both of those guys in the last two years? I don't think it made any sense to go out and trade for Julio Jones. 
And I just think the narrative of needing to have a number one wide right receiver is so massively overrated. Speaking of overrated things, perfect transition. Jordan's up next, and he wants to talk about Braxton Berrios. Hi, I'm I'm uh, Jordan from New Jersey. Hold up, I'm the score right now. But, uh, yeah, I want to talk about Braxton Berrios and our secondary and how I feel like our secondary might not be – might be as good as people think. Okay, first with uh, Braxton Berrios, I want to say that I feel like people are forgetting about him. And since we got Corey Davis, Denzel Mims, Jameson Crowder, Keenan Cole, and I know like there's really no way to use Braxton Berrios really, but I feel like there's some ways to really like, you know, like utilize him and stuff and uh, get him the ball sometimes. Maybe even start over Keenan Cole, to be honest with you, because Keenan Cole really hasn't been good since, I guess, you could say 2017 or whatever. And the second thing I want to talk about with, that, okay. with the uh, – Jet secondary is, I feel like you can kind of compare them maybe to like the Chiefs secondary maybe like mm-hmm. how like you know people really don't know about you know the people back there in like secondary but somehow like they still get like their job done you know and you know so I feel like the Jets this year would actually be good with the uh, you know cornerbacks and safeties definitely we're adding like with Marcus Joyner I know he's like no you know beast or whatever really but you know he's still he's a veteran. Sound. Maybe even teach Ashton Davis some stuff, you know. Uh, maybe even like Bless Austin. So I really feel like uh, the Jets will do good on defense with the secondary. I feel like, you know, they won't give up as much big plays that they did, you know. So, yeah, thank you. And uh, go Jets. Thank you, Jordan, for checking in with us. Um, on the Braxton Barrios front, if he's anything more than like a, a – a sixth wide receiver on your team. I don't think you're in good shape at the wide receiver position, which you can make the case that he's wide receiver six on this Jets team. Um, he's the third best slot on this team right now. I, I don't. I just don't see a role for him. I really don't. He's a okay player. He was an okay player on a two and fourteen team um, that Jets fans fell in love with because he's handsome and is dating a famous player, a uh, famous person. Um, I couldn't even tell you who it is. Uh, which is bad because if they're so famous, I should probably know. But um, Braxton's okay. He he is nothing more than that. And um, I, I again, I just don't understand the the over over value over evaluation of Braxton. As far as the secondary, I think the only way they don't get beat like a drum is if the um, if the front seven gets home, which the, the Jets do have the capability of doing that with how deep this defensive line is. And I think that's going to be the recipe to their success on defense is if that defensive line is getting home, which um, I think could then in turn make things a little bit easier uh, for that secondary. But uh, I don't know if the Chiefs is a great comparison. I felt like they had a couple of veterans in there. Maybe like I think a fair one is the 49ers after like the Richard Sherman injury. Uh, and just uh, last year they had a, a bunch of seemingly no-name guys come in and play okay. Uh, and it's, you know, Robert Sala defense, so... I think that's probably a better comparison for you. Uh, Big Green is up next, and he wants to talk about the Pro Bowl. Hey, Ryan. Big Green here. Wrong shot. Uh, I have a question and statement for you. Okay. So, who, I know it's a bit early, but who do you see on the Jets making the <clears> Pro Bowl <throat> this year? I see if you have a, three players. I believe Denzel Mims, Quinn Williams, and Mekhi back then again. I want your take on that one. And I would like your take on, do you see us pushing for a playoff spot this year? Thanks. Go Jets. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think the Jets are going to be a playoff team this year. I think they're a year away from being a legit contender for a playoff spot. As far as it goes with the Pro Bowl, hmm. Um, Quinnen's probably a good one. Becton's probably a good one. And I hope Denzel Mims a Pro Bowl caliber receiver, but I don't think the Jets are going to have a Pro Bowl caliber receiver on the team. Uh, I'll go Marcus May. Those will be my three who I think have the best chance as of uh, making a Pro Bowl. Excuse me. Ben's 
up next. He's calling in from New Jersey, and he has some guys in the 2022 draft that he already has his eye on. What's up, Matt? It's Ben from Jersey. Yo. I know it's World Indy. A little over a month away. A little, a little over a month past the 2021 NFL draft. But I'm just going to give some guys who I think we could target, depending on draft position, of course, and need, um, just some guys who I think we can target in the 2022 draft. And that's the year I think the Jets can make a big, a big push to make the playoffs. Same. So the first guy I'm going to target is cornerback Derek Stingley. I've, I mean, we, I think cornerback is our biggest need right now. I feel like that's something we can all agree on. I don't. Derek Stingley is projected to go, I think, top five. Um, but he's really good, and somehow if we end up in the top five, top six, top seven, I think he's a realistic target, and he would be an amazing addition for this team. The next guy is is um, Ed Rusher Kayvon Thibodeau from Oregon. Mm. He's a, he might be the best player in this class. He's he's probably like a Chase Young talent. I know our D line is also is really good, but a D line of Thibodeau, Carl Lawson, Quinn Williams, John Franklin Myers, Foley Fatakasi, that is really good. This is true. The third guy I'm targeting is offensive tackle Evan Neal from Alabama. So um, George Vance is not going to be around. He's not our next year. He's um, he's not going to be our future tackle. So um, I think Evan Neal is a perfect tack is a perfect play pick because um, he'll play Austin McKay Beckton, and now you'll have three young young elite offensive linemen: Beckton, Elijah Vera Tucker, and Evan Neal. The fourth guy I want to target is linebacker Christian Harris, also from Alabama. Christian Harris is probably the best linebacker in this class, and linebacker is a position that I think we will have to fill in next year because Jared Davis is on a one-year deal. I think C.J. Mosley is going to be cut next year because we can stay like 15 mil. And guys like, obviously, Blake Cashman, if you breathe on him, the guy's getting injured. He's not He's not anything. <laughs> this, is, this is true. But then, And then guys like Jamie and Sherwood, Hampton the Zero Dean, I think those guys can be solid, but I don't think they have as high of a ceiling as Christian Harris would. The last guy I'm going to target is Ed Rusher Drake Jackson from USC. Okay. Like I said, you can never add too many pass rushers, and the pass rushers and our D-line will be elite if we add him. That's just some guys who I think we could target. It's a little early, but just want to get some names. Thank you, and as always, go Jeff. Thank you, my man. Always appreciate it. You coming in with uh, dropping some knowledge on us. Um, it's a little too early for me to get into 2022 NFL draft prospects. Haven't done nearly enough work yet, but um, agree with you on the ideas of the positions you want to attack. Right tackle is probably going to be a position you're going to look at for. Linebacker, corner. I'm always okay with adding edge. Those are the ones that really stick out to me right now. And, um, you know, with Robert Sala and that defense, you're gonna want to probably imagine that they would look to continue to add at the premium positions, which on defense is cornerback, edge, and linebacker is just gonna be a huge need on that team. Maybe, maybe safety too. If Marcus May doesn't come back, I hope, I hope Marcus May's back, uh, but that could also be a need. Um, but I agree with you for the most part in in terms of the positions that you're looking at. I think you hit it on the head. Ricky in California is up next, and he wants to give the young guns a chance at corner. What's up, Matt? Yep. Uh, it's Ricky, California. First time caller, long time viewer. Uh, not so much of a question, just an opinion. I think we should just ride out with the rookies <clears throat> that we have now. Okay. Um, and hope that uh, Bless and Bryce Hall take that, you know, next step forward. I think we don't need a veteran president, man. I think we just ride it out. Let's throw the rookies into the fire and, you know, have them learn that way. I think our uh, defensive line is going to be so solid that we'll be able to get away with it for the most part. Okay. I don't see us making playoffs, but no. anything over two wins is uh, improvement, right? Amen. Uh, and that's it, man. Go Jets. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Ricky, by the way. Appreciate you checking in with us. Uh, I'm not opposed to that idea, you know, that logic. It makes sense. Like, I, I understand, like, myself, I, I want to add a veteran in here just because I'm not, like, super confident in that group. 
But that's definitely a way that you could look at it is, hey, let the young guys grow. This defense is probably going to have its struggles in the secondary anyway. And maybe you get bailed out a few games because of how good the pass rush is going to be. Uh, but that's certainly like I understand the logic behind the, the, you know, the thought process there of letting the young guys develop and seeing what you can get out of them and who sticks. So I don't necessarily hate that, Ricky. I really don't. Travis in Ohio is up next. He's got some thoughts. Let's hear from Travis. Hey, Matt. Yo. Travis from Ohio. Hey, just wanted to ask you how it felt. How does it feel that we've got a team that actually likes being, being seen in public together, like at the Islanders game? Like chemistry. Like, hell, these most of the time they didn't like each other on the field. These guys are hanging out outside of practice. And this is true. Everything else, team activities. Then <clears throat> the only um, drama we got <clears throat> is two 28-year-old very good players non-pro bowler so and Crowder and May uh, in contract disputes and then other than that we just got some jerk offs on in the media talking smack on us like and Le'Veon Bell of course but he isn't even in the league neither of those jokers in the media so anyway we had like over 80 guys in OTAs volunteer so like that's awesome man I mean that's coming off the pandemic and everything else like these guys it's, it's different man it's different from any other time I ever saw it it's one I know I know obviously know what your take is going to be on it I mean you gotta love it but it just it feels different man uh, I, I know we got the rookie head coach offense coordinator and and head coach so, and quarterback, but expectations are low, but I'm loving the direction. Anyway, go Jets. Ah. Thank you, Travis, as always, for checking in. I do love it. And seeing Robert Sala go to those games, too, and just being into it and being a part of the community. Like, we didn't have that with the last coach. And, like, I don't think I know it's fun to beat up on Sam. It's not. I don't love what's been going on with Sam Darnold post uh, being traded. Um, but like I'll, I'll admit it, I don't think we see Sam Darnold as amped up as what we saw Zach Wilson with Dan Feeney at the Islander game last night. I don't think so. I think it's completely reasonable to say, hey, you know what? This is a different vibe from head coach and quarterback. Which is true. I think that's completely fair. And you know what? I do agree. I think this team is going in the right direction. They're another year away, in my mind, but this team is turning a corner, which is super exciting. I agree with Travis 100%. Last one, let's get to Jeremy in Sacramento. He wants to talk about Bryce Hall. So let's hear him out on some Bryce Hall chatter. Hey, Matt, it's Jeremy from Sacramento. How you doing, man? Yep. Um, I wanted to comment about Bryce Hall and um, your thoughts on his possible regression. I agree with you. He might be exposed. Um, there's no question about it, especially as we look to improve and there's more pressure on him. It's a possibility, um, and it's hard in this team to look at the roster we have, how many people are left to pick people who could regress. But I think out of the four that you picked, what's interesting is he also probably has the highest upside to grow and improve. I so agree with that. So it's kind of like an opposite kind of thing, which way will he go? Mm -hmm. um, and here's why I think that could be the case as well. While I think... Um, there's nothing wrong with what you said, and I agree with it. I also think, what if, because he's in a better system um, with a crazy improved defensive line that's going to have a lot True. more pressure on the quarterback, um, it actually gets a little easier for him. So now he comes back, he has better coaching, he's being coached up, um, he has some experience under his belt, and suddenly, you know, the, suddenly the quarterback is under more duress. Um, he's not having to, to hold down the fort as long. You know, cornerbacks' lives get to, tend to get very um, – it seems to get easier, easier. in, mm -hmm. in what Sal is trying to do, I guess, and in, in other teams that he's coached. Their lives get a little easier. And I just wanted to know if you agree with that. Do you agree that, that Bryce Hall might, might actually take a really big step forward as well as be maybe one of the guys that can regress at the same time? Yeah, 100%, Jeremy. And I'm glad you had this take and called in because I kind of wanted to talk about this video a little bit. So this is a great way to end the show. 
I agree with everything you said there. He could absolutely take a step forward. I How I view him is someone who could be a solid cornerback too. That's where I am on Bryce Hall. When I made the video of reg top regression candidates or whatever I call this, something regression candidates, and I tried to preface it in the video, but still, uh, you, <laughs> the mouth breathers in the comments don't get it. What I was trying to say is, hey, here's a list of players based on what they did in 2020 and versus the scenario that they're being put into in 2021. There might be a little bit of a drop off here. And he explained why. That doesn't mean that I hate the player. That doesn't mean that I think the player is bad. I am just aligning a scenario in which it's possible or outlining a scenario in which it's possible that they aren't as productive as what we saw in 2020. And like I said, the only one that I was like, I see, I really think Crowder makes the most sense because I just don't think he's going to get the volume of targets that he's gotten the last couple of years. I, I think I think Hall's going to be a good starter, but there absolutely is a world where he doesn't take that step. And maybe he does get exposed in a bigger role. I wouldn't bet on it. Again, I think he's going to be a solid player, but people saw like a seven-game sample size in his rookie year and are ready to write him into the the Jets' ring of honor. I'm not ready to go that far either. Like, we got to find a happy medium here. There just has to be. Um, but I'm with you. I think Bryce Hall is going to be a fine starter. And you're right. Robert Sala's defense does make it a little bit easier on the secondary because of how quick the front four can get after the quarterback so hopefully that saves the Jets butt a little bit when it comes to their secondary that's going to do it for me on this episode I know it's a little bit shorter my voice is going absolutely gone and uh, next week we'll be back and better than ever don't you worry it's off season time so get me those questions in we'll talk about it we'll talk through whatever it is that you want to get into but for now that's going to do it for me on episode number 69 nice of just Jets I'm Matt O'Leary and I'll talk to you next time